Hi, I'm John Atak, um, I think, and um, we're going to um, we're going to assault the notion of Christmas and um, be contrarian and that kind of thing. Uh, stuff we're known for. Uh, before we go any further, I visited a friend of mine in Chicago, which is a wonderful place, I think, um, when it's not too windy. Uh, which is most of the time and um his girlfriend was there and um i said uh you know should we really be telling our kids to believe in santa claus and and then you know explain that we've we've lied to them fundamentally and she burst into tears and um she said you know she'd had a rotten childhood dad had been a junkie and the only good thing in her childhood was Christmas. And now I was trying to take it away from her. So that's just to let you know what we're going to be doing here. Fair enough. Um, if I may, I'll share. And by the way, hi, I'm Spike Robinson. You certainly are. The Watson to John's Holmes, the Sancho to his Quixote, the thorn in his side. <laughs> Anywho. When I was about seven, I heard some of the older kids talking about it. And I actually asked my parents and my parents sat me down and talked to me about Nicholas of Smyrna, I think it is, and told me that, yes, there had been a guy that had gone around historically and given people things, but he was long gone, of course, but we keep up the tradition and talk about generosity and he is the metaphor for generosity now why would a seven-year-old know what a metaphor was because my dad coached me to do the punchline what's a metaphor to keep cows in there you go they just keep on coming sadly um they, yeah they... he was a bishop i think yes in, in turkey what is now turkey yes and, um, which doesn't mean the bird and no. uh, why the birds called that it, it was originally called a fuck it in um well there i don't know why we don't call them that um but we call them turkeys anyway and um yeah there are various stories that mm -hmm. um come from there and and when we're talking about a metaphor we we're talking about something symbolic perhaps but it is a pretty strange piece of symbolism why don't you give us your terry pratchett comment on this yes picture. this is from hogfather now in terry pratchett's disc world the hogfather is that world santa claus and death who is an anthropomorphic personification that is Whoa. so people believe in him that he's become this figure in disc world belief actually creates whatever the people believe in so many people have believed in death that he's become this thing that comes up and shows up at people's deaths. In any case, he has, through various means, a human granddaughter, and he's had to fill in for the hog father one year. And this is after all of all of the stuff, and they're trying to explain why he did this. And he said he needed to, otherwise faith would disappear from their world. And she said, okay, you're saying humans need fantasies to make life bearable? Really? as if it was some kind of pink pill? No, humans need fantasy to be human, to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Tooth fairies, hog fathers? Yes, as practice, you have to start out learning to believe the little lies. So we can believe the big ones? Yes, justice, mercy, duty, that sort of thing. But they're not the same at all. You think so? Then take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder and sieve it through the finest sieve and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy, and yet death waved a hand. And yet you act as if there is some ideal order in the world, as if there is some, some rightness in the universe by which it may be judged. Yes, but people have got to believe that, or what's the point? My point exactly point exactly yes Rude to point it, it is an interesting weave that that we 
Of course we believe in fantasies and we invest in fantasies. And Pratt is right to, to say that our noble aspirations are to an extent fantasies, but I would hesitate. I have seen justice done. Um, I've seen mercy in life and I don't have time to grind the universe down and put it through a sieve because I'm busy this week. But I, and I don't think that we are dealing with quite the same thing. I, I think it is, um, it's worthy of discussion. And so that's what we're going to do with it. Um, the Santa Claus, Saint Nicholas, Saint Niklaus, whatever, um, people, most people don't seem to realize that he only gives stuff away on Christmas Day. And the rest of the time, he's the patron saint of thieves. He's the patron saint of repentant thieves, actually. Oh, that's, nice. that's nice to know. because uh, That's, you know, that's a fine it, point. It is a fine he's point. Yeah. Saint of fine of repentant thieves and wrongfully accused criminals. But the idea is that at Christmas time, they might repent from their thieving ways. He's also... And they must be, they must be helping him because there's no way that you could get around the world that quickly. Um, they get something. into everybody's chimney. Well, uh, he's the patron saint of many, many, many people. I found a link last year and I'll put it in the description below. And it's it's amazing how many professions he is patron saint of. So it's a busy life, what with all the elves and that yeah. stuff. Yes. Yeah. And it, the image that we have of Santa Claus, I'm I have read, probably in Wikipedia, so who knows if it's true, um, dates back to around the American Civil War and is then refined by Coca-Cola in the 1930s. And that's the image that we in the US and Britain accept as Santa Claus. But if you go to other countries, Holland in particular, mm -hmm. um, you'll find a, a quite different conception of old Nick. Oh no, this isn't old Nick, is it? This is young Nick. Um, and that of itself that, you know, why do we make up this story? Why do we pass this story on? I mean, we now live in a, a pluralistic society where Many of the people celebrating Christmas don't actually worship in the Christian way. So No, I was raised by two atheists, and yet we had Christmas, and uh, we were in a new neighborhood with a lot of Jewish folks, so I'd go around at Hanukkah to various friends' houses. And yeah, but why? why is Christmas so? I've known Jewish families who also put up a Christmas tree, too. Is it because they don't want their kids to feel left out? Is it just that once you're in a culture, you take up some of that culture's beliefs or even right. just, it's just as decorations? Hmm. And, and and there again, the, the Christmas tree is is a something that it's a pagan is German, uh, goes back to pagan roots, along with the word Yule, of course. Mm -hmm. And in, in Britain, the Christmas tree was was introduced, I think, in the 1840s by Prince Albert. Mm -hmm. um, not to be confused with the jewellery of the same name. Um, so, and that fascinates me that, um, you know, one of my favourite books was The Flight of the Wild Gander by Joseph Campbell. And it's a real tour de force. He generally was explaining, you know, mythology and bringing it into, you know, comprehensible terms. In The Flight of the Wild Gander, he just goes straight for it. And he he talks about um, <clears throat> the way that in the 19th century with, with the collectors of folk tales, the Finnish folk society, the Grimm brothers, who, who were not at any point intending to, you know, invest in Walt Disney. Um, these are not stories that were told to children specifically. They are just folk stories and fairy tales. And Campbell points out how rapidly tradition is assimilated. So many of our stories in the world come from either the Thousand and One Nights, Scheherazade, the Arabian Nights, mm -hmm. or from the Mullah Nasruddin, 
And the one that you've heard me cite often enough is somebody looking for his key under the lamppost and somebody says, is this where you lost it? And he says, no, but there's no light where I lost it. Mm -hmm. And so these are actually sometimes very clever teaching stories. That story, I've read it in three psychology textbooks, none of which credited it to this what, 12th century or whatever text. Um, I'm it's... not sure, but it might also appear in the in the Thousand and One Nights too. There's a heck of a lot of stories in there. Well, that Mullah Nasruddin being a you know a fun you know fundamental collection of they're they're amusing tales, mm -hmm. um, which when you think about them are telling you something about human yeah. and human wisdom, um, and you how to ride back. A lot of them animated now on YouTube. Yeah, see and, if I can. Collection to link. What what Campbell points out is that, that when I think particularly the Finnish folk society looked at stories, they would find that if your grandma told the story, it was now traditional. Now she could have read it in a book. And this is like the uh, cutting the ends off the ham story, where the um the granddaughter being asked by a friend why she cuts the ends off the ham before putting it in, in the oven, says, uh, I don't know, my mum always did it. And she asks her mum, and her mum says, oh, I don't know, my mum always did it. And so she asks her mum, and she says, well, I've only got a small baking tray, so I had to cut the ends off. Now, stories in the same way pass into convention. And uh, let's go into, in, you know, we have to get to the Nazis sooner or later here. Let's get into something sinister, which which is the story of, of the Aryans, which, as far as fairy tales and folk stories go, is very modern. Um there's a, there's a wonderful woman I, I forget her name who 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 got a very posh sort of accent and uh, you know very posh English accent and she did a great YouTube on um, Atlantis and um, yeah where she points out that the story originates with Plato there are two dialogues where it's mentioned it's meant to have happened nine thousand years before and. You know, part of the story is that the Athenians finally defeated these people in battle. And as she points out, there were no Athenians at that time. There was no settlement in Athens until you know, about two and a half thousand BC or something. So I love it when when you have to get that detailed to tell people that they're believing absolute nonsense, something that was invented, but has now fallen in tradition, into tradition. Madame Blavatsky then in the 1880s, a, a complete and absolute charlatan. The um, British Society for Psychical Research, which uh, William James, the great psychologist, uh, was a founder member of, and a variety of other quite serious scientists, um, you know, material scientists, chemists, and what have you, they all, Mark Twain was involved with it, they, they very much wanted to show that there was something. And so when they, their first um, piece of research was into Madame Blavatsky, and much as they wanted to believe, they found that, you know, they talked with people who were doing the little tricks. She had this um, this cabinet where she'd pull out a drawer and there'd be nothing in it and then put it back in. And when she pulled out again, there'd be something in. And the researcher went to India and saw the other side of the cabinet where the servant was pulling it out, putting something in, you know. So, but she invented this story about Atlantis and Lemuria mm. and the miscegenation the interbreeding of the pure atlantean aryans with the Lemurians, and in doing so they lost their supernatural powers what would be called um uh, electron powers because yeah. it was the beginning of the 20th century when two um spurious uh german austrian nobles um made up the story based upon that led to the mm -hmm. labels. Yeah, this is all, all of this, if I may say, garbage is why I left the neo-pagan movement because all of a sudden all the new ages were coming in and feeding us all of this stuff that I didn't think had any, anything to do with the original intention as I felt of simply observing the seasons and honoring Mother Earth. And so we see in a 50 year period that a crazy story told by a mad Russian woman has become essential philosophy to the Nazi movement. 
an essential philosophy to a lot of people who don't know that it's Nazi, but convenient. Or they don't care that it's Nazi. They, yeah. They, yeah. they have no real comprehension that, that, that a story is being made up and that story is then being used for awful means. Because on the one hand, you have, you know, within the Ananeb ministry run by Himmler, who's head of the Gestapo, founder of the SS, minister for the interior, the most powerful man in the Nazi empire outside of Hitler himself, that he creates the Lebensborn to bring back the supernatural powers of the Aryan people by proper eugenic breeding. Now, this, this didn't really happen. The other end of it was, of course, annihilating Jews, uh, Romanis, and enslaving the Slavs. Um, so, you know, the current movement in America where people, simply because they have pale skin, believe that they are Aryans, was not the belief of the Nazis. They absolutely disbelieved that anybody of Slavic origin, anybody Polish, anybody Hungarian, yeah, my Nazi. family was would have would have been where Romanese and Slavs, hmm. uh, even with my blue eyes and pasty white skin. So, so you, you know, uh, we, you tracked it down for me that, that, and I've been saying for years that that Voltaire said that people who believe absurdities will commit atrocities. Well, he didn't say that. Apparently, as you discovered. Um, Somebody who wrote a play about Voltaire took a statement he'd earlier made and simplified it into that. Um, thankfully, the second Prime Minister of India, Srivinas Radhakrishnan, did say it, so we, we can cite him. But I think this is a very, very, very important point. People who believe absurdities will, will or may, let's say, commit atrocities. Mm -hmm. And people who commit atrocities generally either have no beliefs or they believe absurdities. So and the... Oh, I'm sorry, but that is my entire point here, is that the whole belief in Santa Claus, and I'm looking at all of the Santa Claus movies. I just watched Miracle on 34th Street last night, and Very we're close. setting up, it is, it is wonderful, and Natalie Wood was a wonderful actress right off the bat. However, there is this one quote in it that just sets up such an ability to then go on and believe any absurdity you want because quote faith is believing in things when common sense tells you not to to me that is the most dangerous poison and it's repeated over and over again in all sorts of movies i looked up quotes this morning from the santa claus to nightmare before christmas to the Polar Express and found in them all this little poison worm, if you will, of you've got to believe. And if you believe it will somehow become true and that you shouldn't examine closely because then the magic will go away. And somehow if the magic goes away, we lose something, says the woman in Reindeer Antlers. That's it. Uh... Yeah, uh, Cialdini in um, Influence, which, which is a book that everybody should read, um, yes. it points out that he and a, a professor of logic went to a, a, a transcendental meditation meeting. And there were two speakers and they did their bit. And at the end, when they'd done what they'd done, um, the professor of logic stood up and asked them a series of questions. And first one tried to answer and then went, oh, I'm not sure, and passed over to the other one. And the other one, came to the microphone and went, oh, yeah, you make some good points. Then they watched people in the audience signing up for a transcendental meditation course. And so they asked them as they were leaving, why, why did, why, you know, having heard what, they can't answer these questions. And the response, if I remember it correctly, is, is to the effect of, um, if we thought about what you said, we wouldn't have signed up. And we would therefore have lost the hope of a solution to our problems. And I think faith and hope become very intertwisted at this point, that we do need to be hopeful, I think. Not necessarily optimistic, but we do need to be hopeful. From yeah. Hope Alone, this is Christmas, the season of perpetual hope. There you go. Um, 
And from Polar Express, the thing about trains is it doesn't matter where they're going. What matters is deciding to get on. <laughs> it's going to Auschwitz. <laughs> well, there's the thing is that you can get on the train of any belief and deciding to get on before finding out where the train is going to me says some pretty dangerous stuff. Yeah. And, and it's a predatory philosophy, the idea that people should submit to belief, do as they're told, and not ask questions. And this, of, you know, of course, opens up the whole new eon, the whole new age that we start, you know, we can start with, I don't know, Ralph Waldo Trine. That's it, isn't it? Um, in Tune with the Infinite, a book that is not much read anymore, but in its time was tremendously influential in the 19th century. And we have Mary Baker G. Eddy. People miss the G out there. Don't know why. Um, who comes along with this. I mean, Mark Twain's little essay about Christian science is just hilarious. You just, you're absolutely on form. That they believe that, you know, anything that is wrong with you is spiritual. Anything wrong with you is a fault of your thought process or your moral process. And so you don't need doctors, you don't need surgery, you don't need medicine, you just need to get your thinking right. This will give us uh, The Secret, one of Oprah Winfrey's favourite books, um, and people like Deepak Chopra and Eckhart Tolle, who are telling us that when you wish upon a star, it doesn't matter who you are, your dreams come true. This remarkable notion that an individual can somehow control destiny by wishing and hoping and praying and dreaming. Um, it, it's a narcissistic belief. What, what else could it be that I can, you know, move mountains with, with my mind? And it's sold through so, you know, all of the hundreds of variants of Scientology in the world are selling this notion where Hubbard came along and having told us about propaganda by redefinition of words, that you can lead people by the nose, he then takes the word postulate, which is a basic philosophical premise in, re in the real world, and turns it into a wish. So you can postulate things. And the, you have this whole concept within Scientology and therefore, you know, in all of these other places of intention, um, what Alistair Crowley, Hubbard's master, called will. Mm -hmm. And here we have this idea that, that you can control the world by willpower. And if the world is not doing what you want, if you're not getting what you want, then that's your fault because your willpower isn't good enough. It's not because you caught a virus. You know, you caught the virus because your willpower wasn't good enough to stop you catching the virus. This seems to me adolescent at best. And dangerous at worst. Right now, uh, we're hearing, uh, just to bring up Scientology, I was listening to Tony Ortega talk to Leah Remini and Mike Rinder recently, and apparently right now, during the coronavirus, those who get sick are being punished because, of course, they pulled it in. And you must have done something wrong if you got corona. Yeah. And also just going back to controlling things by, here's a lovely quote from Santa Claus 2, seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. Well, that is probably true, and but not in the way the author intended. Or similarly from Nightmare Before Christmas, just because I cannot see it doesn't mean I can't believe it. Here's the thing. We've we've had a couple of people commenting on the channel in the last glorious three and a half years since we launched, um, trying to explain to me that they don't believe anything, that they're rational, they're atheists. And there was one guy who was quite annoyed with me for saying I'm an agnostic, which is a different thing from an atheist. And uh, he said, you know, no, you've got the choice. You can be a theist or an atheist. That's your lot. But when people tell me they don't believe anything, it it stops me in my tracks. It's like, really? We, you believe that? <laughs> we, we live, 
can't, I'm told. Um, somebody I find completely un, unreadable and incomprehensible, but he apparently in the 18th century said that there is the world around us and then there is the world in which we live. And each of us is living within our interpretation and perception of the world. I think that's a very wise thing. Um, Ron Hubbard in Scientology uh, said you have your own universe and, you know, not quite the same thing. Um, uh, Kozibsky, Count Alfred Kozibsky, uh, founder of General Semantics, uh, which is very influential on various therapy movements, including Dianetics. Um, and he said, the map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. We live in the map. We live in what we believe the world to be. And we behave towards people based upon our belief about what they are thinking and feeling and what they are intending. Um, it is said by some neurologists that the brain is not an interpretive mechanism, but a predictive mechanism. So we are trying to work out what's going to happen next. We live within what we believe is happening. The belief in God, the belief in there not being a God. I'm an agnostic. I, I hold the position that I don't know. And what really annoys people is I don't care. You know, I really should. I really should get upset about this. Um, but it, it seems to me we can only travel to the extent of human meaning. And human meaning seems to me somewhat less than um, the what is possible. If we take then uh, Maimonides, and I, I knew you were going to bring that up, um, The Guide of the Perplexed, written, I think, in the 11th century. I'm sure you'll put the date down. The first paragraph, this is a, a Jewish philosopher living in Andalusia, uh, which is at that time uh, and had been for some time, uh, several hundred years, a, a Muslim province in the south of Spain. Very nice, too. Um, and pretty much by far the most sophisticated place in Europe. I mean, they had um, functioning sewage systems. They had street lighting by the ninth century in this place where um, the grubby Europeans were not even washing and, you know, ooh, horrible, stinky. So Maimonides in his first paragraph says, um, man is created in the image of God. This does not mean anything physical. And I think that's a very wise statement that if we are to, I'm an agnostic, you see, I can talk about God, it's okay. That what differs between ourselves and the other creatures, apart from us wearing fig leaves to cover our genitalia, is that we have imagination. And if indeed there is a God, then he, she, or it has an incredible imagination to have generated all this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And there we are. The imagination is, is a, a very fascinating place. It is perhaps the most remarkable talent that a human being can have, to have imagination. They, great scientists have imagination. Great artists have imagination. And yet, the manipulation of imagination, guided imagination, mm -hmm. an essential aspect of the whole of our culture, you know, what people want us to believe. During the COVID-19 pandemic, our Prime Minister, bless him, Boris Johnson, tried to close down a study being done by Professor Tim Spector into um, the nutrition to find out if poor nutrition could make people more vulnerable to COVID-19 and make it last longer. And he, Johnson tried to close this down because Spector was disagreeing with the belief that was being put forward and which led to the death of many more than 100,000 people because Johnson did not do the right things fast enough. Um, but because something disagreed with his belief, then it was to be stopped. That study is the largest public study ever produced. It, nearly 5 million people were involved in it, mostly in the UK. But it led to a conclusion which was, yes, if you eat ultra processed food, if you have a very high sugar diet, um, then you will be more susceptible and you will take longer to recover.
you know, long COVID is, is more likely. So, and that kind of belief versus science, belief versus reasoning, because science too can become belief um, orientated, oriented, sorry, we're talking to American audience here. Um, and uh, they're both there, orientated, oriented. We don't, we don't really mind. Um, take your pick. That we can start focusing on faith, or indeed we can start focusing on common sense, which is also not actually an evidence-based way of, of looking at the world. No. What we need to talk about is perhaps, are these views harmful? You know, is, is it harmful to believe in Santa? That's what I'm I'm wondering, because in watching Miracle on 34th Street through the eyes of somebody who was looking for this, immediately I thought the way that Doris Walker, that is the mother of the of the young child, was raising her child in a very respectful and actually admirable way. One of the first scenes is them watching the Macy's parade underneath and the kids going, oh, wow, the, the jugglers are better than last year. And hey, I like the new Santa Claus, meaning I like the new man that you have hired as mm -hmm. Santa Claus, not act because she doesn't really believe in Santa Claus. And she's and. And Doris right away says, yes, well, he's a substitute. And the kid says, really, a substitute? Why did you have to get rid of the first guy? And she tells her in an age-appropriate way, well, you remember how the janitor got last New Year's Eve? Oh, yes. That is the previous Santa that our Chris Kringle has replaced was drunk as a skunk. And yet she describes this to the kid in a very respectful age appropriate way she's telling this kid no santa doesn't exist but she's trying to give her rational good uh, tools to manage through life with and yet she's portrayed as somebody who's somehow being ignorant and not giving her child a world of fantasy to believe in to the point where Fred Gailey, the romantic interest of the mother says, look, Dora, someday you're going to find that your way of facing this realistic world just doesn't work. And when you do, don't overlook those lovely intangibles. You'll discover that those are the only things that are worthwhile. The only things that are worthwhile are lovely intangibles. I, I do think that this really does tie into some very important ideas. And um, I've been banging on about Eric Fromm for a couple of years here. Um, and he, in, in Escape from Freedom, in 1941, trying to explain what he had seen in Nazi Germany uh, before fleeing to America, um, he comes up with this idea that people don't develop a self that that they they have a pseudo self now i i don't think these words are necessarily appropriate because i think i think what he's pointing at is incredibly important i'm just saying that um there's another way of looking at another way of describing it which is to say people don't grow up they don't actually develop a, a mature yeah <laughs> I was looking at my reindeer handlers. Yeah, I think we know all know. Penguins that. behind me. Penguins behind you. Yeah, exactly. People don't grow up. Um, some people to be um, to have childlike aspects of of one's character. I think is a good thing. To be childish, on the other hand, can be a bit annoying. And I think that Fromm's point. There's a there's a part of it. He will later in 1965, the heart of man. He he will develop the idea of what we call narcissistic personality disorder, what he calls the malignant narcissist. And I was left, having read half a dozen of his books, with something that he doesn't seem to be explaining, which is he reckons about 60 percent of people are do not develop a self, and he reckons it's getting worse. Back in 1941. And 
at one end of this 60 percent are the malignant narcissists because his revelation is you know that freud was wrong about narcissism um that it isn't narcissism we've done a show about that uh, i think think was with chris wasn't it with chris shelton and, yeah well i'll put a card in the corner yeah and, and i think that's it's very important to to try and understand because it's become very popular narcissism it, it's like people are being accused of it all the time and yeah what you fairly drip with narcissism. It was oozing. Oozing, yes. oozing. Yes, right. Narcissism. And you took the comment down because, you know, I went to answer it a week later and say... Ad um, hominems are right out. <laughs> well, I just wanted to ask the person what they meant by narcissism. Fair enough. I'm sorry. Simple enough, simple enough question, you know, um, because it's better to bring people on board if we can, mm -hmm. even the snarky people. Well, uh, yes. Yeah, about 60% of people won't grow up. They won't become adult. They won't become responsible in the world. And they will always be looking to somebody else to approve of them. Mm. To say, you know, well, you know, you are right wearing the right dress or driving the right car or eating the right food. Or A lot of people are status driven um, because they don't feel comfortable in their own skin. What is rather obvious, if you think about it, is if there are malignant narcissists, and if narcissism, as he says, is the inability to feel love and the need for adulation so that yourself will be created from the outside. If we have a, a one end of the scale malignant narcissism, which are you know people who are dangerous to the world because of their um, their need. To, to dominate others, their need to to prey upon others, um, because they don't feel love, mm. you know, and that's very sad. Then I would suggest that, and that's you know what less than ten percent of the of, of the world must be. Oh yes. Uh, oh, yes. And you, <clears throat> so we've got another fifty percent. What are we going to call them? Well, I'm going to call them benign narcissists. On occasions, they can even be benevolent narcissists. I think. Um, in the music industry, we see quite a lot of this. David Bowie and Elton John are the examples I've picked on before, who are both men who struggled tremendously with their sense of identity until they became, you know, after they'd become very successful. I think David Bowie really did grow up. You know, he says, you know, Major Tom was about him. His parents were indifferent to him. Um, and so he wanted adulation he's quite open about this later in life and i think once he got it he actually did grow up and you know did remarkable things um i've been just this week actually been listening to the next day which is his last but one album which is absolutely wonderful and reality and the hours and there are so many great albums later on which show a very um developed view of the world we show compassion towards uh, other people, you know, getting my views from a Benetton ad looking through African eyes on black tie, white noise. Um, but he's somebody who grows out of it. And and if we are saying, and I am, that it's a failure to grow up, well, that means that 60% of the people are waiting for the next um, offer of uh, paradise, the next you know, sanctuary from, from the world. And they're believing in it. They're, they're, they believe the ads. They believe the, the propaganda, whatever it is. Would you also say that that is why there's poor reasoning skills and also bringing back to the Santa things um, a tendency to immediately clap down on anything that does not believe as you do? Because I'm just looking at another quote here from Santa Claus 1, uh, where Charlie, the son, says, Neil doesn't believe in Santa. And Scott, the Santa, the current guy who's Santa, says, well, Neil's head comes to a point. Ah, there Just you go. Going, well, ad hominem. Huh? So what he, he says doesn't matter. Yeah, that, that it's a these simplistic ways of excluding other perspectives and mm. and it does it you know 
we're going to have to get into it because Santa Claus is a metaphor for religion. Fair that, enough. In my household, it was a metaphor for generosity, but my household was unusual. Yeah. It was, you didn't actually believe in Santa, so it, yeah. it was purely metaphoric. Whereas it, for many people, I think it is the sense that you're letting go of faith. You're letting go of hope to believe in something. And like the woman I met in Chicago, that for her, I mean, she also, look, let's, let's be honest about this. I, I'd bought a, a, a bottle of Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, which cost like 20 bucks or something. And this is 30 years ago. And she put ice cubes that had strawberries in it, you know, so there was a different perception of the world to my own. And and I, I did manage not to say anything about that, you know. I but, thought you were going slightly different, which was another point that I wanted to make where my sister believes that Santa Claus was the excuse you used when you bought something that was way too expensive for you to put your own name on the box. And so it was a way to say this gift is just way too out there. So it's from Santa Claus. Mm. Well, it's certainly one way of looking at it. <laughs> but does the, you know, we are asked to believe in um, mythological creatures. Um, anthropomorphic personifications? Well, it's not necessarily anthropomorphic personifications, you know, turning, you know, giving mice a human character or, or your good Beatrix Potter and all that stuff. It's more the idea of the hero that projecting the notion of the perfected human being. And this is so dangerous that, you know, Salman Rushdie recently found out after many years of harassment and persecution how dangerous it can be to suggest even that these revered figures who may or may not actually have existed, to even question them that the belief is so strong that people are willing to kill you know, or in Salman Rushdie's case, the fatwa said that he should be killed. Mm. And um, our friend Christian Shcherko, um, had I remember him coming from away from a conversation with Cat Stevens um, at a Mind, Body and Spirit Festival after Cat Stevens had become, um, long after he joined a Sufi order of, of, of Islam, and that Cat Stevens was saying, no, he deserves to die, you know, for having said these things. And and this is kind of weird because Cat Stevens was actually a really brilliant man. Wrote some you know, of the best music ever. Yeah. And yet off he went after the Buddha and the chocolate box and all that. So there's this idea of this character who still exists and we can welcome into uh, through our chimneys or into our hearts. So does it put a a strain on those people who choose to believe in Jesus, in the bloke that Salman Rushdie got into trouble over, who will not be mentioned, um, or the Buddha, or, you know, Shankar. Robin Hood, to bring it down to your neighborhood, how much pushback is there against saying Robin Hood may or may not have existed? Well, uh, yeah, of course, there's absolutely no evidence that he did. No. Um, but if you go to Nottingham Castle and speaking of mythology, it's not a castle, but it's a great big Georgian house or like 17th century, actually. So it's before the Georgian. But um, during, after the Civil War, the castle was torn down. So we've now got this great big mansion house, which is called Nottingham Castle. And you expect to believe that. But in front of it is a huge statue of Robin Hood as portrayed by Errol Flynn, you know, speaking of how traditions, you know, I think the story of Robin Hood as we have it is mainly the one from the Errol Flynn movie. Oh, I had friends who who swore blind that they were in Robin Hood's uh, troop in a former lifetime. Will Scott started going, okay. Yep, Friar Tuck, Maid Marian, all that good stuff. Oh, and that yeah. they were a coven too, and you needed a defrocked priest and a non-virgin woman. I think everybody needs a defrocked priest and a non-virgin woman. <laughs> um, so you know, we get into all of yeah, exactly these figures, some of whom are pseudo-historical figures, 
if we look to Robin Hood, one of the other pseudo historical figures is King John. There certainly is no evidence uh, that supports the idea that Robin Hood, the sheriff of Nottingham, uh, and King John were um, hanging out together. And the reality is that the that when you know the biography of King John was written by uh, the first biography was written by Roger Wendover, the second by Matthew Paris, who were both monks at Canterbury. And the big story in King John's time, he was king from uh, 1198 to 1216, King of England. Um, the big story is basically that, that when the Archbishop of Canterbury died, he set about appointing a new one. And the monks said, no, we want this bloke. Now, the king had always appointed the Archbishop of Canterbury for rather obvious reasons. Um, so the mission was sent off to, to Rome and the Pope decided he'd put his own guy in john refused him entry to the country and he is excommunicated the whole country is put under interdict so that um religious ceremonies can't be performed uh, which means that babies are going to hell because they're not being baptized you know you're bearing in mind the infant mortality rates at the time um that meant there were a lot of babies that got a pretty hard time of it because the pope didn't like <laughs> john king john in turn then of course confiscated the housekeepers of the priests because if not very long before the catholic church had decided that um, priests should be celibate because they didn't want to pay for the housekeepers as they would later become known they didn't want to pay for the children and they didn't want the property inherited by sons they wanted it given back to the church yeah, they had to remain with the church and um it's very interesting, you know, that it took a thousand years after Jesus for the Catholic Church to lay down this tradition, which is now so accepted. Um, it didn't happen in the Orthodox Church. So accepted that when I talked to a Catholic friend of mine about it, she just flat out denied it. No, no, priests have always been celibate. In the Orthodox Church, um, and, and it says in Catholic histories, you can go and look at them. But mm -hmm. in the Orthodox Church, the, the, a priest can marry mm -hmm. um, and a monk is celibate. And that this was enforced. But anyway, he, King John, waggish man that he was, actually confiscated all the housekeepers of the priests. And things got worse and worse until eventually he actually signed over the rulership of the country to the Pope. And his son, Henry III, was governed by a papal nuncio, I think they're called, uh, who, because he came to the throne as a child. And, and so England was governed by Rome which is a, a very brief, brief period in history, thankfully. But that two Canterbury monks then wrote the biographies of King John means, you know, we have A.A. A. Milne's wonderful King John was not a good man. He had I was little. just about to say. <laughs> and and the concept that it was is in history books, uh, the famous Victorian historian J.R. Green um, wrote this damning um, statement that would, kids would read at school. And so poor King John. In the 19, late 1940s, early 50s, the daily records of the court, the pipe rolls, were open. And they found that this guy had actually spent his, his reign, uh, 18 years, traveling up and down the country dispensing justice at a fraction of the cost that his father had charged. Um, and that he seems to have actually given you know, good rulings. Um, so there's a mythology of King John, a mythology of Robin Hood, a mythology of Santa Claus. Does this question the, the view that Christians have of Jesus? Should, hmm. or that Hindus have of Krishna or, or what have you? Are, if we question Santa Claus, are we going into territory where people are going to become seriously offended when we say, what, what is actually your evidence? for Jesus's miracles, or let's say at Muhammad's ascent to heaven. Or that um, Jesus wasn't an amalgamation of like five different guys. Or they... that Josephus invented the whole Jesus story for, for the Emperor Titus uh, as a way of controlling the Jews, as a way of creating a Jewish sect that would be obedient, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, because the Jews, bless them, were the one people in the empire who refused to bow down to the emperor as a god. And 
than that problem caught on in Christianity and and the modern Orthodox and um, Catholic churches and therefore all the Protestant churches that come from them um, are you know bundled up in into this set of you know th they basically again refuse to bow down to the emperor and we get the Diocletian persecution in the and the, the revelation of St John in response to it and all of this wacky stuff and I'm afraid believers in in the revelation are going to have to forgive me for that because you know seven-headed lambs with seven eyes you know it, it's it's a bit too much for me Douglas Adams I believe in uh, Dirk Gently's holistic detective agency posits that it was because the man was just too fond of the mushrooms of the area well um John Allegro the um biblical scholar who first published on the subject of the Dead Sea Scrolls um he wrote a series of four books and um I think the last one is called something like The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. And he starts out in the 50s with this really academic book going, why aren't... You know, because he's not allied with the Catholic Church. I think he was based at Manchester University. Why won't they let us release the translations of this material? Which seems to suggest that there was a teacher of righteousness, Zadok, who was pretty much said what is in the Sermon on the Mount... 50 years before jesus is meant to have said it you know but he then he eventually came to the point of view and and i parted company with him there that yeah they were all taking magic mushrooms and that that's what's actually going on or if we looked at another you know another analysis of of the the jesus story then um we have robert graves's uh, he, he wrote with a, a rabbinical scholar called joshua podro and they wrote a huge text called the Gospel of the Nazarene Restored. Um, Nazarene being the term that was originally used for Christians. They weren't called Christians until much later. The followers of Jesus were Nazarenes. And we know, uh, or we know, the texts tell us that they were expelled from worship at the temple. That somewhere in the 60s, around 70 AD, um, the Christians, as they would later be called, the Nazarenes, are told you either give up this idea of Jesus being the Messiah, the Messiah, um, or um, you you go your own way. Meaning that up until that time, Nazarenes worshipped with their fellow Jews in the temple. And indeed, um, James, the brother of Christ, as he's called, uh, who heads the Nazarene movement is a rabbi, a Pharisee, no less, and the first martyr, St. Stephen, is also a rabbi, hmm. and I believe a Pharisee. So stories are created and constructed. That that's that's my point in this elaborate statement. And we then come to believe. Now, what's underneath this? The idea of um a benevolent and loving God. The idea that the universe is ordered, the idea that, that there is a point to the universe, there is a purpose to human existence, that we are evolving spiritually to become... The rising people. age, meeting the falling age. Yeah. And, you know, as, as Muhammad said, you know, man can be as, as evil as the beast and as, as good as, as the angel. And... We do have, and you know, so this idea of the imitation of Christ, Thomas Akempis's title, but what Christians are meant to be doing, they're meant to be living in a, a good and decent life. Whereas, in fact, of course, you know, we see the mafia, the Cosa Nostra, praying to God on Sunday and cutting bits off people on Monday. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole web of belief, Santa is kind of the light frothy bit um I, and, and what i'm going to say about that is that i think it's fine for people to believe but if they can't have their beliefs questioned and they can't have a civil conversation about it then they should worry about their beliefs 
if, if they want to scream their heads off at people that disagree with them, if they want to silence any opposition, then they are narcissists. <laughs> that, you know, to the extent that that term is, is accurate, that they have not grown up. We, we need to be, of course, we should be intolerant of intolerance, as Isaiah Berlin said. But if somebody, their metaphor for the world is Christianity, fine. If their metaphor is Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, um, the wonderful uh, beliefs of the Aborigine peoples of Australia and some of the, you know, the Cherokee beliefs, I read a lot about that to write Voodoo Child, this is fine. As long as what they believe in is not making them antisocial and against other human beings. You know, when Christianity became, and it happened very early on, um, when it becomes a way of bullying people um, and murdering people, you know, the, um, the various movements. I mean, the first genocide in the Catholic Church is against the Albigensians. But there have been problems immediately after Constantine decides he's going to become Christian one day, on the day before he dies, they start killing off the so-called philosophers and they start, um, you, you have the iconoclast movement as it goes along. These ways of developing hatred, of using a doctrine of mm. you know, a bloke coming down the, the chimney and giving us all presents, and the misogyny in. that uh, who who was it who first introduced them all the misogyny? It wasn't Saint Paul. It was Rome. Jerome. Rome. Yes. Yeah. Um, so about... When you really look at it, you think that Jesus didn't have twelve apostles. There was also Martha, Salome, all of the the women were also there. I've read some of the Apocrypha and the women are sitting right there next to the men and even sometimes getting the point before the guys do. Yeah, and I mean, essentially, um, Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. you know, there is no reference to her being a prostitute in mm -hmm. the gospel. That is made up later She's on. An unmarried woman. Yeah. Which... You know, yeah. becomes a little bit odd, and that's one of the things that that fascinates me about about faith and the faiths. That in fact, they change with time. So that when the Tyndale Bible, the first um, English Bible, um, and the King James, beautiful King James Bible, is large, is based upon the Bishops' Bible, which in turn is based upon Tyndale's Bible. And Tyndale, of course, was burned at the stake for doing this, uh, which I think was a little unpleasant, personally. Mm -hmm. um, but when people could, instead of having the Vulgate, the Latin Bible, and let's face it, none of the original was in Latin. Um, it was written down in Greek, the, the New Testament and the, the Old Testament, largely in Hebrew with, I think, one book in Aramaic, mm. which is the language that Jesus would have spoken. But the idea that you have to follow this Latin Bible... And so therefore people would go to church on a Sunday and they'd have these readings in Latin and they wouldn't understand a word of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's translated. They find out that there are no priests or monks mm -hmm. in the New Testament, which was a bit of a shock. Same with the Amish are finding out there's nothing about which way you're meant to cross your suspenders. Well, that was actually, my mother used to tell me that that was when she stopped believing was in 1967 when Vatican II came out and all of a sudden the texts were being read in English rather than in Latin. And, she, mass, yeah. and she found out that the stories really didn't make sense. There was also an argument because when she was pregnant with me, she would not sign the piece of paper saying that she would raise me as a good Catholic. Mm -hmm. And if she didn't she sign didn't. that paper, I would go to hell. <laughs> and so my grandmother actually had to kidnap me slightly after my birth and give me that little lay baptism that you give to babies if they're in an airplane and crash. But since I didn't follow through on it, sorry, grandma, going to hell anyway. But... But all, all, all our friends will be there, so it'll be fine. You know? What I also wanted to say was it's interesting that um, there was such a thing about in the Bible being in English because now 
we've got people in this country that think that English is the original language of the Bible. God's own country and God's own language. Mm. Fervently. And it just disturbs me that they can't even see and that Jesus was an American. And originally that was just a straw man, but now it's these people really honestly believe that they don't even stop to go, wait a minute, Jerusalem, where is that? It's in Arkansas, isn't it? I think there's a Jerusalem in New York. There might be one in New Jersey. I don't know. Uh... But it, it's like when you, when you look at a, you know, a Peter Bruegel painting um, and, and see all of the people, even in Rembrandt, dressed in contemporary dress, looking at the cross or, you know, they're portrayed as we are now. And I think that is the way we see the past, that... Um, we see them as ourselves. Yeah, that their society would be like ours. And the the sense of entitlement that, you know, I think was probably new to my generation, that, that we were the after the Second War, we grew up feeling entitled. And, you know, looking back at, um, say, the mass observation surveys of the 1930s, the first huge sociological surveys, which continued right through the Second War, where ordinary folks are writing down their experience and looking at film of how people lived in the 1930s, how the majority of people lived. You know, we were a third world country then. And mm. the progress that occurred was, you know, to some extent by stripping the rich of some of their wealth, the collapse of the aristocracy between the wars and, and what have you. But the expectation rose, and now the expectation is often to be provided for, and in the first world, in the, in you know the place that isn't Russia, China, or the third world. Um, there is this, and and we live in that fairy tale, and that fairy tale is perpetuated by Disney, by by other people, uh, in in the you know the film world. And it does give people hope, but it gives them expectation as well. And you know, I, I do believe that it would be better if children had some experience, if only brief, of the hardship that is suffered, you know, by people who have to walk five miles a day to get their water and stuff like that, to have more of a sense of the world in which we live rather than the, you know, McDonald's world. Well, that's well, why I think every family should take their children camping. Well, I don't know about that, but um, uh, uh, that's well, just to be able to go. Okay, you have to chop this wood. You have to drag this water. Um, but even also that, and isn't Disney it cruel? Isn't, isn't it cruel? Isn't it cruel calling that a holiday though? <laughs> a vacation. This is, true. this is true. But also Disney has gotten better at that, but also the unrealistic relationship expectations that you will find the one and you will immediately be in love and it will be beautiful and you don't even need to talk. You can get married within three days of meeting the person and everything will be perfect. Love at first bite. I say. I want to ask you, John, because I didn't, of course, didn't uh, have kids, but you had four. How yeah. did you handle the Santa Claus ch uh, question, if I may? Never had to. And and people have asked me this before, but I, I never told my children there was such a thing as Santa Claus. And um, whatever conversations were had um, would be, well, yeah, it's a, a character was invented to personify this this season it's not the kind of thing you say but i mean when my oldest boy ben was was six he came back very excited from school one day and he said uh, did i know about jesus and i said uh, go and ask them about hell you know see see what they feel about that and a couple of weeks later he, he said to the teacher who made god and so I thought we won't get into the prime mover and moved bit. We'll just leave him to have the conversation. But no, my children were born after I left Scientology. So 
And I did take the point of view that it wasn't really necessary. You know, we don't really do the Easter bunny all that much over here. Mm. Um, the tooth fairy would, would give them money when their teeth came out. But eventually they saw South Park and that was all exposed that it was actually Eric Cartman. And, uh... Oh, my. Mm. Well, that's actually, again, going back to Pratchett, where Susan, the granddaughter of death, is being raised not to believe in any of the stuff that actually in that world is real. And that teeth were paid for by her father. And one day she went up in the attic, found a collection of old skulls and started <laughs> giving her father teeth. And he was too busy with stuff because he was a duke and he lost track. And she ended up making quite a, for a small fortune off of him just by extracting all the teeth that she could find around the castle. Um. And then there may there be a, a sort of metaphor for how we've coped with belief <laughs> in years, you know, that that people will um, follow the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. Um, but also when you bump up against somebody who really does believe and you've been raised not to believe, for instance, I was raised in a very rationalist household. And yet back here in Vermont, there was no public kindergarten back when I was ready to go to kindergarten. That wouldn't happen for a couple of years. So the only kindergartens around were religious ones. And my mom found a nice Lutheran lady who promised her she wouldn't do any religious education. And bless her, I honestly don't think that she thought she was doing religious education. She was just telling me about Jesus. She didn't make that connect that that was religious education. And so I came home crying at Easter because we'd all killed baby Jesus. Mm. And my mom was livid. Yeah, like rich tapestry. Uh, yeah. Mm. But so do you think that children should be raised to believe in Santa Claus? Or should they be told this is a metaphor for the season and generosity? Yeah, the 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 latter that that um I I do think there's I, there, I mean there's a slight danger that children will cease trusting their parents when um they they work out this is a story but I have heard of that happening a couple of times but not that much mm -hmm. there's so much because you know the the world in which we live is a world of stories. It's a world of narratives, where we seek to predict. We we seek to make sense of what we're experiencing, and the, there's a problem in if it interferes with our determination to seek evidence and and to check things out. Then it can become a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really was railing against some of these movies, because the trope in the movies is that the rationalists are somehow wrong and ignorant and need to be educated by the people who say that, once again, got to quote this, faith is believing in things when common sense tells you not to. Mm -hmm. And that is the correct view. And that you've got to have faith or it won't happen. Um, in Polar Express, I believe it is that you can't even you can't even experience the magic of the Polar Express unless you believe that you won't even be able to go into that lovely thing until you actually believe that happens in Narnia too with Aslan. If you convince yourself hard enough that Aslan isn't real. You don't get to go into heaven. I know. And um, I and and I I you know I I read the the Narnia books as a kid, and um, thought they were fine. I was I was quite annoyed when, as a you know teenager, I discovered that that they were propaganda. And you Susan know, doesn't get into heaven. Yeah, quite right too. You know, we're talking it it's a bit more vague what's going on, but you do get that he was a hardcore Catholic. Mm -hmm. 
and he had a little bit of a thing about orcs. And um, how can a whole race be evil? Well, that's... because they're created by Saruman, or that's what what Christian tells me. Um, but it, yeah, I, I I read the the Lord of the Rings when I was twelve, or again when I was eighteen. I read it when I left Scientology when I was twenty eight, and I came away going, there must not be anything that can't be redeemed and um you come to that question of whether they are robots or have human consciousness you know or have consciousness and um you know so i think we should probably be nice to robots too oh well uh, pratchett actually in unseen academics has an orc character that everybody thinks is evil he must be evil because he's an orc but actually he's a very nice young man who just wants to play football yeah and I think that's that's a tragedy for most orcs. Um, and I, I like that because Tolkien's a linguist, you've got, they're called orcs, then you have the uruk -hai, and the elves call them ears. Just wonderful. But um, what's his name? Clive Staines Lewis, was it something like that? C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. That he was really, everything was about bringing people to Jesus. And so Aslan as Jesus and all of this, that, that he's kind of persuading children mm -hmm. so that they won't believe. And I found that a little bit patronizing and annoying when I found you out. You can buy t-shirts that say Aslan is Jesus's fursona. Yeah. Well, so the, you know, the furry movement. All right. No, tell me about the you furry movement. People dress up in fur suits and pretend to be these animals as furries. It's a whole thing. Don't look it up if you don't haven't seen it. You don't want to know. But fursona is if I was a furry, I would be like, say, this big purple squirrel. And that would be my fursona, a big purple squirrel. So Aslan is Jesus's fursona. Hmm. And I, I, maybe it's time to talk about Trekkies. But and oh, I uh, the wrong shirt today, then definitely put in a link to our friend Roger Nygaard's wonderful yes. entries, Trekkies and Trekkies too. Because here we have people who, for the most part, understand that this is a fantasy, and yet they dress up in costumes and they do all this stuff and they invest their life into it. And that's a you know an interesting side issue to religious belief. Mm -hmm. and for some people, a replacement. They belong to this community with um, Mr. Spock and um, William Shatner, Do who was fantastic in Boston Legal. Anybody, you know, Boston Legal, brilliant. William Shatner, great. Do you think that maybe in a couple of millennia, if humanity survives, there might be people who actually think, say, the Marvel characters, the Trek characters, Doctor Who, would actually have been real after, say, two or three millennia. I, I I think it's entirely possible that that you know, looking at the way that you know a bishop in Smyrna, um, who um, decides to to give to those less fortunate than himself, um, becomes a big jolly bloke who somehow, despite being let's face it, a little bit on the obese side, manages to wriggle down chimneys and um, you need to leave mince pies out for him and stuff. It's uh, where where is that 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 border? Where where do people cross over into where the belief? You know, if you don't believe in Sandra, I'm going to come around and firebomb you. You know, <laughs> where does this become um, dangerous? And it. I think it's in the depth of belief that for most people, they don't believe in Santa. They tell their kids about it because it's a charming fantasy. Mm -hmm. And they probably don't need to think any more deeply. But as you say, that the industry that has grown up around this, the um, Santification, is, becomes a little bit alarming in in this idea of yeah give up rationality give up science give up evidence and do as you're told do you know returning scientology one of the you know i think it was accidental i think most things are accidental with ron hubbard it's a stroke of genius to tell people that the 
best you can imagine is true. You are eternal, godlike, and can be totally happy and brilliant. And walking up, you know, it's 39 years since since I left. Looking at it, you're going, this is a fairy story. It, it's not even a very good fairy story because it's pretty two-dimensional. It's like, you know, you had doll bodies on another planet and all of this kind of stuff for one and a quarter quadrillion years. It's pretty boring and stuff. You know, it was a fairy story then. Yeah, Xenu myth is, is the the core fairy story, the one that Hubbard was working his way towards from the very beginning, because in 1952, when he's lost the rights, he sold the rights to Dianetics. He doesn't own the book or the, the word anymore. And he has to create Scientology and he goes directly to Alistair Crowley as, as his source and then adds in science fiction because in his later years as a pulp writer, he was writing science fiction and, you know, just about making a living almost from it. But uh, as he spent money like water, that was one of the phrases I heard most from the people who'd worked with him. He spent money like water. You know? Well, that um, photography equipment is expensive. Yeah, to have, what, 2,400 cameras. And that includes Hasselblatt's. And I recently, a, a young friend of mine was talking about buying a digital Hasselblad. And I went and looked it up and it was uh, six to nine thousand pounds for one camera. So, yeah, Hubbard had, uh, I mean, that's, you know, just having one for every day of the year, that must be enough. But no, <laughs> far more than that. But so, you know, is it safe to prepare us in this way as children? I'm not frightened of death. I'm not frightened of the reality of living. I, I think it's a wonderful thing to be alive, and I'm tremendously grateful for it. And while I wouldn't normally cite Franz Kafka, he said, you know, death is is the, the purpose of life, you know, that it gives life purpose. Yes. That thing which is... You know, possibly why people want to believe things rather than dealing with reality. I'm not, you know, I'm incredibly fortunate. I'm not having that much problem with reality. You know, my life is easy, really, compared to most people, I think. Yes. So I don't have those struggles. And if I do have a chimney, but there's a cowl on the top of it, and I don't think Santa can get I've through. I've got a piano blocking off my chimney. Um. But I wanted to also ask you about, because it was also the do as you tell, I was just discussing with my nephew's uh, wife, he just got married this September, and she was telling me as the oldest child of all her cousins, she had to keep on the belief, keep the face of the belief because of the the younger ones, but also that there were no less than three elves on the shelf that had to be consulted and if those who don't know what an elf on the shelf is um i'll link of course to our uh little santa cam video that you did you and sam did a few years ago but the elf on the shelf supposedly spies for santa and then reports back it's a way of controlling children be nice equals presence yeah i mean i mean the, the yeah the, the the one that that we talked about in that that long video. I, I went into the local pharmacy and it was after Christmas and they were getting rid of these. And it it is uh a, it mimics a camera, you know, the 360, you know, the all-round view yeah. 360 degrees, the all-round view cameras, security cameras, and you stick it in the kids' room and tell them. Now I I do think that, that is probably a little dangerous and oppressive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the the elf on the shelf is just a little bit much too. Hmm. Yeah, we we shouldn't be doing that. Well, have we about done it? Do you think? I think we have. I think we have discussed everything there is. Good, it's and just to say that whatever faith you celebrate and whatever holiday you celebrate, make sure it's a good one. Yeah, be be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Exactly. That's what we advocate, and, and we wish you a merry festivity. <laughs> Even if it's Festivus. Exactly. Right, well, Spike Robinson, John Atak, um, put a dollar in the box, uh, sign up for Patreon, 
Um, Thank so, you so, to all our contributors. Yes. Yes, our many contributors. And um, please join in with them, you know, become one of the um, John Atak family and friends cult. And um, you will ultimately, if you donate enough, get a free pair of reindeer antlers, probably. Yes, th thanks very much for, for spending your time and a happy Christmas, happy Hanukkah, happy whichever festival you're, you're going to celebrate. And uh, be kind. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. I think everybody needs a defrocked priest and a non-virgin woman.